be joining this evening. Super nice. Sorry? Yeah, go on. Wait, go on. Okay. Great to see so many joining, and uh, I guess we will uh, see a couple of more coming a bit later. Uh, please let the questions flow in the chat. I will interrupt Andreas and or we will have the questions afterwards. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, maybe I should just introduce myself. I'm Jimmy, Jimmy Nilsson from Factor 10, and I have the pleasure of being a colleague of Andreas. So, uh, well, we write code together on a daily basis and other stuff as software developers do. But uh, that's everything from me. Over to you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is uh, Andreas Hjellström. I work at uh, Factor 10, just as Jimmy. Uh, I work as a, a coding architect, is what we call ourselves, uh, which means that we, we, we love to code and program, uh, but we also care about the bigger things like uh, system design and architecture. Uh, but we prefer not to become the type of architectures, uh, architects who are not involved in the actual programming, uh, you know, the ivory architects. Uh, so we call ourselves coding architects because that's what we do. And I've been working with Factor 10 for, I think two, it's two years now. And this is like my, uh, my fourth or fifth time with Food Cafe. I've been both in Malmö and Stockholm a couple of times. Um, uh, but this is my first Food Cafe where I will talk about something really uh, something really touchy for people, uh, which they could care about. It's almost like religion, which front-end framework am I supposed to use? So this one, I'm uh, kind of out of my comfort zone, and uh, we'll see how you guys take it. Um, this is also my first time live sending on YouTube, and, and thankfully I've got Mickey from Food Cafe helping me out with uh, the technology, so uh, I'm just worrying about uh, a Zoom meeting and I'm presenting to you guys. Uh, so some of you have already been starting to ask some questions in the chat on YouTube. There's a, a, a live chat out in the right side of the, the window uh, or on the mobile, I guess it's below the video. So just fire away any questions you guys have. Um, I'm not sure if they will be delayed or anything, but uh, try to interrupt me if you have any questions and I will answer them straight away uh, while we're in context. And if you think that this is not related to what I'm talking about right now, just keep the questions and we will have a chat afterwards and, and I will answer any questions you guys have uh, regarding this. Okay, so let's get started. Um, there we go. This is my agenda for today and I have about 45 minutes. I'm not sure it's gonna take 45 minutes, but somewhere between 30 and 45. Uh, this is what I'll be going through. Uh, I'm not gonna read them to you guys, uh, but uh, I will start with some top level stuff. I will start with the background to why I'm having this talk from the beginning. Uh, I will go into architecture of both uh, uh, Blazor and, and Vue, what they have in common architecture wise, and uh, we will touch upon a lot of topics. And then at the bottom, uh, we will decide which one of these two frameworks is the best, which one will conquer the world. Okay, so, the background to this talk is actually a, a customer project. We had a customer a couple of months ago. Uh, we actually started talking to them about a year ago and we started coding with them a little more than half a year ago. Uh, and and they, they have this old technology stack based on Microsoft Web Forms. Uh, they write the Visual Basic, .NET stuff, uh, and they needed to renew their uh, both architecture and their technology stack. So they contacted us at Factor 10, which is a great idea if you need help with uh, technology leaps. And said that, please, can you guys uh, give us a, a, a proposal for a new architecture, a new technology stack, uh, how we could use this in order to write more uh, testable software, to write more reliable software, uh, to, have, uh, to, to be able to attract new developers to our teams, uh, et cetera. So uh, we fired away. We gave them a proposal uh, based on a view for the, the client side. So they write uh, a view application in, in TypeScript. And on the backend side, we would have a C-sharp backend. Uh, so it'd be C-sharp.net core three uh, back then. 
Uh, and we worked with that for a couple of weeks. We built an application, uh, which were starting to become feature complete. And the customer said that this is quite many steps to what we are used to now. And worst of all, we're leaving Visual Studio. We don't want to leave Visual Studio. Uh, could we perhaps take a look at Blazor? And uh, uh, I was not overly uh, uh, enthusiastic about the, the technology the top the, the technology behind Blazor because it's so new. And I think that you're putting yourself in the in the backseat of Microsoft very well. Uh, so we said, OK, let's give it a couple of weeks and see what happens. So we, we actually ported, ported this uh, Vue plus C Sharp backend application, which we built, into Blazor uh, and had the same features. The Vue application were uh, both test driven from a, a unit perspective, but also from an end-to-end -end test perspective. So we had end-to-end -end tests written in Cypress, which we could reuse in order to see that the, the migration to Blazor from Vue were feature complete, which was cool. I'll go into that later on. Uh, so that is kind of like why I'm here right now. I had the, the, the possibility to write the same application in first Vue, uh, it's actually Vue 2, and then uh, write it in Blazor, Blazor server. Um, and at Factor 10, we get uh, some of our time, uh, our time at work, to, to work with stuff like this, like presenting at the Foo Cafe or going to conferences and, and, and sharing with the community. And I think this is, a, this is an important topic to share with you guys, to share my experiences and my, uh, uh, how I felt that the transition was and what the differences were, where, where were the headaches. OK, so that's the background. And you have uh, all read the ag agenda. So let's get cracking. Uh, Architecture-wise, uh, these two are uh, not at all the same. They are very different. Uh, we have Vue, which like, is just like a client-side library. It's not even a full-blown framework, according to the makers of it. It's just a library. Uh, and it's written in JavaScript. And it has a, a great uh, amount of packages which you could include and, and run with Vue. It has a large ecosystem. Um, it is, you, could, you can use Vue for building uh, single page applications, uh, large ones or, or small ones. You could use Vue uh, on a single page, just drop it in and write some, some client side enhancement in order to get that page more responsive or, or uh, uh, just a little bit more user friendly in some way. Uh, kind of like jQuery back in the days. Uh, However, you should not do that with Blazor. Blazor is more like a, a, a full-blown framework, more enterprise-y than, than Vue is. Uh, Blazor is based on uh, ASP.NET, and it's shipped with uh, .NET Core, came with .NET Core 3, uh, and, and has had a lot of development in .NET Core 5 and will in .NET Core 6 uh, as well. Both of these um, frameworks or, or uh, library as Vue is, is trying to solve one thing, and that is making a, a richer client-side experience, experience, making a web application feel just like an application, not just a website. Uh, so they will give you, uh, they will help you building logic and functionality that will give the user a better experience. Uh, both of them focus on, on the view model of the, model view, view model pattern, or, or um, yeah, pattern, uh, which is to say that they do not care about the actual, the real presentation, not, not the graphics of what you build, and the, they do not care about the model. They, they, they're not trying to, to intervene with the model or the graphics, but the stuff between, the view model, the one linking your domain model to something that is graphically presentable to the user. So any logic you can think of between those two. Uh, there we have Blazor and, and Vue trying to help out. So they both encourage you to write uh, Pojos or Pocos, plain old JavaScript or C Sharp objects, and use that as your model, your domain model, uh, and put your business logic in there and just write a presentation layer with, with one of the frameworks. Uh, there's a, uh, another difference uh, between them. Uh, or not. Uh, Blazor is shipped with something called Signal R, which means that uh, out of the box, it will try to communicate client to server with WebSockets and will have a fallback to HTTP. 
and with Vue, uh, you're on your own because you have to you have to pick your communication protocol yourself. Uh, you could, of course, do it with uh, Signal R, um, Signal R, WebSockets, or or HTTP. Uh, but it, but Blazor is more opinionated that way, and it's actually shipped with uh, SignalR. And in the case with Blazor server, you you can't choose; it is SignalR. Uh, so Blazor comes with two different types of um, uh, hosting options. The one I've been uh, I'm going to talk about here is called Blazor Server, which is what it sounds like. It's a server rendered Blazor application. So you write all your code in C sharp. Uh, and all the code will uh, execute on the server side. Uh, and there is a little JavaScript bundle written by Microsoft, which is called like Blazor server.js, which is shipped to the browser. And that will handle all the communication between the browser and the server and enhance the experience in the web page for the user. Um, and yeah, enough about that. Um, then you have Blazor. WebAssembly, which I'm not going to talk about here, but they are quite similar. You write you write code in the same way, but they are hosted in different ways. So Blazor WebAssembly is actually run within the browser. So you you build your application in C sharp, and you have the .NET Core. It's compiled and and shipped onto the browser where it can run. So you actually run your code inside the browser with WebAssembly. Uh, so there is a difference between uh, Blazor Server and WebAssembly where you execute the code. It's either on, on the client side with WebAssembly or it's on server side with, uh, uh, with, with the server option. Uh, of course, in the server option, you are executing some code on the client side, but uh, most of the time you, you don't have to write that code yourself. It's uh, generated from your C Sharp code. Uh, okay, let's go in to more details then. Um, both of these frameworks encourage you, or they force you to, to build something, uh, to build all your stuff called, with something called components. And in both frameworks, everything is a component. Uh, the smallest little button on the page is a component. The page itself is a component. Um, and as you can see, demonstrated down to, to the right, which is uh, an image I, I borrowed from the view uh, documentation. Uh, the, the flat presentation of a page uh, to the left, the gray one, is actually a tree of components. So a component can uh, consist of multiple components, or it could have a, a long chain of components inside it. So you can have child and parent components, uh, and, and everything is a component in both uh, frameworks. So what does a component do? If you come from, uh, like my customer, uh, you have a, a, an ASPX background, uh, writing web forms, you're not probably you're not familiar with uh, with a web component. Uh, sorry, not web component, but a component. Um, web components are something else. Um, so the, the thing about the component is that it will isolate behavior. So for the user, it will isolate one type of behavior. And if that's a button, perhaps it's a button click listener, uh, trying to do something when, when you click on the button. Uh, if it's a list, then it's something regarding that list. And it will also isolate presentation. So uh, the markup for this component is isolated within it. And also, as we will see later, the styling as well. Um, and in both frameworks, we have well-defined uh, life cycles and APIs for the components. And, and with that, I mean, you have some kind of uh, setup functionality, post setup, uh, pre setup, and you have teardown functionality. So you can, jack, uh, you can hook into uh, life cycle methods of, of the components and, and do stuff when they, they are initiated or when they're teared down, uh, which you will need, of course. And they have also a well-defined API with parameters in and out, uh, allowing you to pass information from a parent component down to child components uh, and so forth. Uh, in both of these frameworks, a, a page is also a component. I'm not sure if I said that, but a page uh, is a component as well. So everything is a component. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, components. This is um, typical component syntax. Uh, I will use this pattern for the rest of the presentation. I will try, try to have, or I will have a uh, view to the left and place it to the right. And you guys can see the various implementations. And uh, uh, in both cases, I have the same functionality written in, in the, uh, the two different frameworks. 
Uh, in Vue, I have used something called a single file component, uh, which is when you put both uh, the, the, the markup, the templating, you put that on top of your, uh, in the top of your file. And then you have a script block where you can put your JavaScript or TypeScript, uh, the logic you want to execute regarding this component. And then you have a styles block uh, where you can write your CSS or SAS or whatever you're into. But that's where the, the, uh, the style sheets will go. Uh, and for Blazor, you have kind of the similar uh, setup. You have uh, at, the, at the top, you will have your HTML, your markup. And then you have a, a code block uh, where you can write the C sharp code or F sharp or whatever. Uh, and then you will have a separate file uh, with the same name as the component file, but with the .css suffix instead. You could also write uh, SAS or, or less or whatever you want here. Uh, and of course, in, in both cases, both Vue and Blazor, you could split these up into three separate files, one for uh, markup, one for uh, your logic, JavaScript or C-sharp, and uh, one for the style sheets. Um, but I prefer to have them in one file. I know where to look. And it also encourages me to, uh, to, to keep the code uh, clean and, and, and less write less code in one file because if I write large components and I put all of these uh, blocks in one file, the file will grow uh, very big and I don't want that. So uh, keep them in one file. Uh, it's easier to overlook, I think. Uh, and to the yeah, enough about that. Uh, let's go deeper into functionality. So in order to to actually be able to give the user some form of some form of uh, enhanced behavior, you will have to have DOM listeners because the DOM is basically what the user sees and what the user interacts with. Uh, clicking and typing and uh, dragging and dropping, uh, that's based on the DOM which they see. So you have to have DOM listeners. Uh, what we have here is uh, just a simple on-click listener on the bottom button. And to the left, we have uh, the view component, uh, which just declares a regular HTML button with the at click attribute, which is a view attribute, uh, uh, where we specify which function we need, we want to execute once the button is clicked. Uh, and then in our script block, we will just have to define a function called button clicked, and uh, that will be executed once button is clicked. Blazor is uh, almost identical to uh, to the view implementation. Uh, you will have a regular HTML button and you will have the at on click uh, Blazor attributes and you will say the function name which you want to call. And you will declare that in code block uh, down below and you recognize the C-sharp uh, uh, C -sharp language. Uh, the thing to note here is that uh, if this is Blazor server, which it is for me, if you click the button on, uh, in the view application, this will only execute within the browser context. This will never leave the browser unless you tell it to by making HTTP calls or whatever. It will stay in the browser. But in the Blazor server uh, case, the click will actually uh, send information to the server saying that this button has been clicked and uh, the button clicked function, as you can see in the bottom of the Blazor component, it'll be executed on the server. And if that has side effects like updating the state of this component, that, that state will be sent back over the signal or connection to the little script bundle, which Blazor gives you, and the DOM will be updated if there is any DOM elements affected by this state change. So there's a lot of logic going on there. And of course, there is network communication. So if you have, uh, if you're sitting on a bus or you're going home uh, and you have a shaky internet connection, this could actually uh, fail during the button click. Uh, in the view case, if you have no side effects over the network, that will not, will not happen. If this were Blazor WebAssembly, that would not be the case. It would just execute on the client side as well. Okay, so that's the DOM listeners. So once we can uh, pick up user interactions from the DOM, we tend to want to update the DOM on user action. So that's called data bindings. We want to take our data and in some way present that in, in the view in the in the markup for the for the user to see. Uh, so we have data bindings here. Um, what we have here is uh, a two-way binding example. You see this kind of stuff uh, everywhere when you have client libraries, client framework libraries. <clears throat> uh, you have uh, an input in both cases. Uh, which have some kind of uh, model. In this case, it's called the message. And 
when we type in the input button, we will update a paragraph saying that the message is and whatever you guys typed into it. So in the view example, we actually only have a template block. We don't have to define a function for doing anything um, uh, cool here. We don't have to write any logic for this ourselves. We just say that we have an input and it has the V model message and that variable will be created for us. And we can use it later on in the, in, in the markup. Um, and in the Blazor case, it's almost the same. Uh, we have to explicitly bind to the input event. I'm not sure if that has changed now in .NET 5. Um, perhaps it is. I think this example is written in .NET Core 3. Uh, not sure. Uh, but we say that we want to bind to a value called message. Uh, and then we say that we bind on the input events. So what this means is that when we input into this field, Blazor will try to send information over the network back to the server and update what we have on the last row here, uh, which is the, the private uh, member, the private field called message. It's a property actually. Um, so set message will be called over the network. Um, simplified. And uh, once that is done, the state has changed. The, the field message has been updated and that will be propagated back to the client and the DOM with the paragraph saying messages will be updated with the, with the updated uh, message variable. So pretty similar here. We have to write some code for ourselves in the Blazor uh, example. We have to declare the variable message. If we don't, we will get a, a compiler error saying that you don't have this variable. Uh, and we have to uh, listen to the on input event as well, but pretty much the same. So uh, next thing, which you should care about uh, because you are uh, good at software developers is uh, dependency injection. So why is that important? Uh, you, you want to have proper dependency injection in your components if they should do anything else than just updating a variable like I did in the, the last example. Uh, you want to be able to, to give them uh, singletons or implementations of classes which they can operate on, fetch data, send data, calculate data. Uh, and most of all, you need this for testing. You need dependency injection for being able to test your components in, in, a, in a unit testing perspective where you can actually feed it faked or mocked or stub data uh, and, and test the behavior within your component. Um, with Vue, this is a little bit tricky. Um, it's not super easy to set up, or it's not super obvious how to set up dependency injection in Vue. Once you know how you can do it, it's, it's easy. You, you, can, you can see it here in my presentation. Um, but there is no like a, a clean and a suggested way of doing dependency injection in Vue. Um, I know this is easier in both React and, uh, and, uh, and Angular, but in Vue it's kind of hard. But you can solve it in Vue with something called provide inject, with which is, it sounds like dependency action, but it's not actually built for dependency action. But here it'll, it'll do the work. Uh, so when I declare my application, I have my front end application written in view. I do that in my main.js file or main.ts, whatever, uh, if you're writing JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, so I say that in this application, I want to provide stuff. So I declare provide and I have a service which I will call the service. This will become a name later on. Uh, and, and I create a new user service. So I say that given the name user service, the left hand, uh, you shall provide a this instance of the new user service. Great. And then in my template component later on, uh, I can say uh, in the script block, I say that I inject something. Uh, I want to inject something which is a user service. And the name, the string on the right hand, is uh, the same name as I provided up in the main.js file. So in the component, when bootstrapped, it will get the instance of user service, which the application has from the main file. And then on, uh, on the last row in the uh, create function, I can call this dot user service, which is the name from the inject uh, row, and I can operate on that like a, like a, any regular variable in here or, or field. And this, of course, enables me to, during unit testing, inject something else, uh, some mocked user service, which does not uh, go over the network in order to fetch data or, or something like that. Um, OK, but in the Blazor case, this is far much more simple. 
uh, because ASP.NET is packed with, uh, is shipped with dependency injection out of the box. And, and you can, of course, use that in, in Blazor. It's the same for Blazor server and WebAssembly. Um, and kind of like in the view case, you have a startup.cs, a C sharp file, uh, which is equivalent to the main.js file. Uh, and in the startup, um, in the startup class, you will have a configure services method, which is called by Blazor. And there you can add all your services, which have different scopes. Uh, in this example, it's a singleton. So for every user in this application, they will get the same instance of the user service, which I provide here. So what I say here is that I have an in interface called I user service. And the implementation uh, I want to provide to my application is user service, uh, capital U. So there is a class somewhere called user service. Then in my uh, template component later on, I can say the, the top line, I can say inject an I user service, which I will call in this context, a user service. So kind of like the view example here, I now have a, a field called user service, capital U in, in the component, which I can use on the bottom row where I say user service dot get first name. So same functionality, you can see the similarities. Uh, it's a little bit more wiring by yourself in the view case and it's a little bit more out of the box in the in, in the blazer case so andreas i have a question here shoot uh, if you have to become a design pattern which one would you become and why if i had to become a design pattern i have two kids so i would become the factory pattern of course uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I listened to a talk by Dan North a couple of years ago when he said that if you wake up in the morning thinking uh, which design patterns should I use today, you should probably not go to work that day. Uh, you should use them on a need to know, on a need to have basis. Uh, I don't have a, a, a particular favorite design pattern. Do you have one, Jimmy? Uh, well, I think I really like uh, thinking of myself as a null, null object. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, otherwise, if we're not talking pattern, it's, it's patterns. If we talk anything else, uh, may I, I do like principles more than patterns. So the single responsibility principle is a favorite of mine. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Um, you will have to tell me later on who put that question out, and I will try to track them down, Jimmy. Okay, so uh, let's skip along. Uh, oh, there is one important thing I want to say here. In the case of uh, Blazor server, mostly, this executes on the server, as I said, and uh, you will declare all, all your dependencies in the same startup file. You will declare your uh, services which you use for the, 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 the view components, the, the, uh, the presentation layer, and you will declare any services which you use for like, uh, say, database interactions, uh, repositories, or, or anything like that. All of that will be declared in the same place. Uh, and all of them can be imported into the, the components uh, for, responsible for the presentation layer or uh, any other middle layer you have, which makes it fairly easy to start mixing up like database communication within your uh, components responsible for just presentation layer. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the big drawbacks of Blazor, I think, that it is so easy for you to take that kind of shortcuts, which will actually uh, punish you later on for not having clean separations between your layers and, and stuff like that. So be aware of that. OK, so testing. Um, this is the kind of thing that is super important when you try to select a framework or uh, a library to use. but most of the time when you look at documentation pages, testing is the last thing they list in the bottom of the left nav on the documentation page, you will find some uh, poor chapter about testing. Uh, Vue and Blazor are not uh, any exceptions to that rule, unfortunately. But I think you should, when you try to evaluate the new framework, you should try to unit test in it as soon as possible just to see, is it, is it possible for me to write great tests for my components here, or will that be a headache? 
fortunately, both Vue and Blazor components are easy to unit test if you want to. Uh, on the Vue side, you have something called Vue Test Utils, which is um, a very great util. Sometimes it feels like it's an after construction, but I think it does the job well. Um, and what what view test utils is it it provides you an environment where you can run your your component as if it were inside a browser, which is it's not, but you can simulate that with view test utils, and you have a lot of uh, uh, easy access ways to manipulate your component and uh, read and write properties of the components and stuff like that. And uh, when it comes to test runners, you're uh, uh, you're on your own. You can pick whatever you want. Uh, you can pick Jest or Jasmine or uh, whatever you want. And you can have a search in libraries, which you want as well. Uh, it's plug and play like the rest of the JavaScript frame, um, uh, ecosystem. For Blazor, you have something called test host, which is which also feels like an after construction, but uh, it will do the job uh, in order to simulate that browser context for you. Uh, there's a, a third-party uh, library built by one of the one of the contributors to to Blazor. It's called BUnit, which is a lot more uh, easy to to work with than Test Host, in my opinion. Uh, with a few lines of uh, C sharp code, you can you can bootstrap your components in a in a browser context, and you can use BUnit to trigger input uh, events or uh, or other stuff on the components in order to to make them testable. Uh, and it also kind of like the view test utils gives you a way to uh, to talk directly to the class behind the component to the C sharp class and access uh, public properties and methods on that. Um, and just like view, uh, when you need your uh, testing framework or test runner, you you can pick whatever you want. You, uh, I tried both n unit and x unit. Uh, they both do the job well. Um, so. Pick whatever you like there. Uh, both frameworks are fairly easy to test. Uh, nothing, nothing to complain about there. End-to-end uh, -end testing, though, as I mentioned in the beginning, end-to-end uh, -end testing was uh, uh, was a big part when writing this application for the customer. We wrote most of the end-to-end -end test before for writing the actual production code. So first we wrote a Cypress unit test, uh, sorry, an end, end test, executed that. Uh, of course, it, uh, it didn't pass. And then we started writing production code to make that end-to-end -end test pass. So we test drove the application from, uh, from Cypress tests, which uh, was straightforward, nothing to complain about. Uh, and then when we decided to migrate to Blazor, we, we said that, okay, let's, let's make these tests pass. Um, which they eventually did, but we had some issues with uh, something called uh, a server pre-rendering in, in Blazor, which is a functionality where Blazor will um, create all the markup you need to give the user an impression of that the application is uh, loaded and bootstrapped and, and it's there for you, but it's not responsive in any way. There's no data bindings uh, uh, yet, and you can't interact with the application. And, and having uh, it respond to you, um, which we noticed when we run, ran these end-to-end -end tests because Cypress is a lot faster than I am in, in clicking and uh, typing. So Cypress came into the site, started uh, typing into fields, submitting data, and nothing got registered because Cypress did work before uh, Blazor had time to bind all the elements to, uh, uh, to the logic behind them. So we actually turned that off, the server pre-rendering, and, and just rendered the site when, uh, so w when it's rendered, it is completely binded and everything. Um, this uh, is only a problem in, in uh, Blazor server, of course. You don't have that in, uh, in the assembly version, but beware of it if you write these kind of tests. Um, okay. Uh, Another question let's go on. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, so Facebook uses their own framework, React, as Google does with their Angular. Are you concerned about the fact that Microsoft isn't promoting Blazor in the same fashion as Facebook and Google does? I'm not concerned about it. Uh, I think that Microsoft have their way to, uh, to promote this in, in a lot of ways, of course. I, I hope that 
because my first reaction when they, the customer here started talking about Blazor was that, okay, this is another silver light or, okay, this is another uh, solution which they will work on for like five to 10 years and then completely abandon and then everybody have to migrate to something else. And the reason for me to, to suggest Vue in the first place is that Vue is not um, owned by one of these big corporates, as you mentioned. Uh, it is driven by a, a, a community and it has a, uh, one guy responsible or uh, at the helm of this uh, development. So I think that Vue offers far more transparency than, uh, than a, a corporation uh, could ever offer you. Um, Blazor started as, a, as an internal hobby project at Microsoft, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think that might be why it's not promoted in, in, in any great sense. And Microsoft had a lot, has, have a lot of uh, frameworks on their, uh, in their backpack. So uh, hopefully there will come a day when they think that Blazor is uh, mature enough to, to like uh, promote it in a, in a, in a better or, or more grand way than they are right now. But it is under heavy development. Uh, they had a lot of things scoped for .NET 5, which was released in November which they had to remove from that release and postpone to .NET 6 in November to, uh, 2021. So maybe that's a reason for not promoting it as well, um, that it's actually under development. And you can tell just from skipping from .NET Core 3.2, I think, to .NET 5, you had a lot of breaking changes in the, in the APIs of the components and, and uh, how stuff are set up, et cetera. Hope that gives a question, uh, a reasonable answer to that question. Okay, uh, let's uh, move along to error handling. If you're gonna write any logic executing uh, on the client's uh, side in the browser, you're gonna have to have error handling because stuff can happen. Um, and I will focus on what what these guys don't do well. Uh, in the view case, you're, you're actually executing in the browser. So if stuff crashes there, you are responsible of communicating this back to somewhere where, it, where the logs can be uh, read, where you can pick up that an error occurred. Uh, if you don't, the, the error will occur in the, in the user's browser and uh, will never leave that place and you will not be uh, informed about it. So in some way you have to uh, log back this uh, error which occurred and you're in you're in charge of that yourself you have to do that yourself um, and in the blazer case uh, that's taken care of for you you can just uh, write to uh, standard output and it will be written both in the console and on the console server side so that's fairly easy to, to have a, a proper logging and error catching logging uh, set up however in the blazer case you don't have a great way of doing uh, some kind of catch all error handling. Uh, this was actually in scope for uh, .NET 5, but were removed and postponed to .NET 6. Uh, so if you want rigor error handling and uh, preventing the users from, uh, from facing exceptions, then you have to have try catches in all your code blocks in every component, which is, uh, uh, tedious and leads to a lot of defensive programming. So uh, if you don't catch all exceptions like this, you will have something called a circuit break. And circuit is something which signal R, you remember signal R responsible for the communication between client and server. Uh, they set up a circuit for you. And if an exception is thrown, is thrown from a component, the circuit will be broken. Uh, the user uh, can and will be informed if you choose to. You can actually detect on the client side that the circuit has been broken and you can give the user a message that, uh, hey, we could not connect to the server, you have to refresh. And that's what you have to do. You have to do a complete page refresh uh, in order to reestablish a new connection. Uh, and that means that all your state is lost. The same is of course true with, with the view case if you haven't persisted to like session storage or local storage. Uh, but this is, uh, it's annoying for the user because you have to do the page reload. Uh, the, the site will actually look like it is responsive, but it's not. You can't click anything and you will not get feedback as a user. So you have to handle all of that as a programmer. And that is a major drawback with the with Blazor right now. 
Um, just one and more of course, question. yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just Shoot. one more question before um, the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. I save the rest for later. Uh, does Blazor have the concept of life cycle methods for components? And do I have to manage stuff like unmounting components myself to avoid memory leaks? You will not have to unmount the components yourself. Um, they will be garbage collected. Um, not sure about the WebAssembly version. I can't uh, answer confidently about that. But for the server version, you do not. You can implement like uh, the disposable interface, and you can dispose of stuff which you need to dispose yourself, but but you don't have to. Um, I'm not sure if this is a memory related question. If it is, then, then Blazor is a little bit uh, uh, tricky, at least Blazor server, because all the sessions are held in memory, which actually forces you to have a lot of uh, <laughs> space in memory to, to use for all your sessions. So if you're going to have a lot of users, then you're going to have to have a lot of memory uh, available. Uh, whilst in the view case, uh, the session is kept within memory within the browser. So it's just, it's, outsourced to the browsers. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's carry on. Routing then. Uh, if you have pages in a single page application, you're going to need routing in order to, to navigate the user between these. Um, and in the view case, you will, uh, uh, you will have to pick your own router or write your own router. Uh, and most of them, I think all of them I've looked at is uh, centrally declared, which means that you have one place where you write all your routes. In my case, that's the router.js. And I declare all my uh, routes here with my sub routes. And I also can uh, implement like uh, authorization checks within the router. So in this example, in the before each, uh, which is the router hook. Oh, I forgot to answer the question, Jimmy. <laughs> um, OK, let's skip back. You asked about the life of components. Yeah, as I said, they have uh, pretty well-defined life cycles, the components. Uh, you have like uh, set up, and you have tear down functions, which you can jack into. Uh, and that's uh, basically the same for both Vue and Blazor. OK, uh, heading back to the router then. Uh, in this case, I have a, a router dot before each in the center block here. Uh, where I say that if you try to access the route named bar, then you have to be authorized. Uh, otherwise, I will redirect you to, uh, to foo. Um, and in the Blazor case, you, you don't have this centrally declare and, uh, declared, and it's not, and it's not uh, pick your own. It's built in. Uh, so for every page component which you have, you will, uh, at the top of that, you will say this an, is an at page, and you will, in a string, declare that which route this uh, component will listen on. Uh, and then uh, for the authorization example, I have uh, the bar component in the lower right corner, uh, and I declare that this should be authorized with an attribute here as well. Uh, so it's uh, decentralized versus views centralized view uh, of the router. Uh, and you, uh, you also get some help from the, the compiler here, because if you try to, to run an application and have two components with listening to the same URL, uh, you will get a compile time error saying that uh, this is not uh, going to work for you. Um, yeah, uh, internationalization was a, a big thing for, for the customer, which I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, one of the requirements for the uh, stuff we were going to propose to them were uh, the possibility to, to have translations on the web page. Uh, so we looked into uh, internationalization. And for Vue, it's kind of like the router and the uh, uh, testing frameworks. You're, you can pick whichever you want to. Uh, I went with Vue uh, I18N, uh, internationalization, um, which is just a, a library where you can identify uh, where you will get your translations from. I had JSON files shipped with the client side bundle. Uh, with all the translations, so I had language files for each language supported, Swedish and English. Uh, but it could be like network calls or, or anything else to get the translations. Uh, and and the, this library is bit, pretty much plug and play. Uh, in the Blazor case, it's not that feature complete that, as it is with Vue uh, i18n. Uh, but we use something called uh, a localization, uh, 
the localization package, uh, which is a part of uh, the .NET Core. Uh, and we can use uh, string localizers to, to look up strings from keys and we could use string interpolation to to put variables into uh, translated sentences and stuff like that and uh, kind of like with, with view you can serve the translation files from a resource file or from json or network calls or database if you want to uh, so pretty much the same here uh, not much to complain about uh, easy to handle Form validation. Uh, this is uh, uh, where, where these two frameworks actually start to diverge and, and have different uh, ways of, of solving stuff. Um, in the view case, uh, you are very, um, they are very uh, tightly coupled to either the view or the view model. So you write your, uh, let's say that this is validation for a field, uh, an input field, the name of the user, for example. You can write your rules for that, for, for validating the field. You can write that either in the view, in the in the templating, the, the markup, or you can write it in your view model in the JavaScript and, and tie that to the, the field. Uh, and you have a lot of options here and you have a lot of uh, uh, opinions saying which one to use. And it's basically up to you where you want to put your uh, validation. Uh, if you want to tie this with some kind of server side validation, you have to do that yourself. You have to do that work uh, and, and tie that manually. So if you don't just want to be able to write the name, you want to actually look up if this name exists in a user registry or anything, uh, you will have to do that yourself. Um, it's doable, of course, um, but it requires some work. In the Blazor server case, however, uh, it's, it's uh, a bit different. All validation is uh, connected to either your view model or your model. Uh, so you can have the same validation uh, for all your models and use that inside your presentation as well as in your domain logic layer, uh, which is when you put that in the model, uh, not in the view model. Uh, you can, of course, have it in the, in the view model, of course, um, uh, if you want to as well. Uh, and, and the validation here just works out of the box. Uh, the, the great thing is that you write all your validation in, uh, in just C sharp, and, and you have to write it once. In, in the case of view, if you have a backend with uh, an API, you have to validate the input both on the client side in view, and you have to validate on the, the backend side in the survey API as well. Uh, so Blazor actually saves you a lot of effort here because you can have the same model for for server-side and client-side uh, uh, application. Um, yeah, carry on. Style, I see that I'm running out of time. Uh, styling uh, in, in these two frameworks is uh, uh, pretty much up to you. You can pick if you want to write CSS or SAS or less. Uh, you bring your own. Uh, Blazor, however, is, is shipped with Bootstrap and no CSS preprocessor. Uh, the same with Vue, you pick your own. Um, but but the, the thought of just shipping Bootstrap is kind of nice. If you're not a, a front-end developer, uh, you don't have to, you don't want to make these kind of decisions yourself. You just want something that works. And Bootstrap is there to, to help you with that. So that's kind of easy to get uh, starting with, uh, with Blazor in, in the, the case of styling. Uh, and both frameworks have something called CSS isolation, which means that if you have a component and you want to style, for instance, a button to have the background color pink in just that component, no, no one else, <clears throat> you can write styling for the button within the component. You don't have to declare like a specific CSS class or use the ID for the button. You can just say that buttons in here are pink. Uh, and that will be isolated to that component. So other buttons will not be pink, which is great. Um, and that came in uh, .NET 5. It, it was not uh, present in .NET 3. So that gives a little hint about how under development Blazor is. Um, and from the pre-release of .NET 5 to the actual release, they changed how you can uh, or how you should uh, import these styles to your page as well. So it's, uh, yeah, that's under heavy development. Uh, okay, so browser integration. And 
I think this is my last deep dive slide. Yeah, it is. Um, if you want to do anything related to, to stuff within the browser, like you could, for instance, want to set a cookie or you want to uh, send notifications, you want to do anything that is browser specific. Uh, that's easy with Vue because you're in the browser, you're there, you can do whatever the browser allows you to do. Uh, but with Blazor, at least Blazor server, that's not the case. You're in .NET, uh, and you will have to uh, you will have to use something called JavaScript interops, uh, which is a way for uh, Blazor to expose JavaScript to C sharp. So you can from C sharp call JavaScript functions, and these functions are declared in interops. So you can have a JavaScript function written, which will write a cookie, and you can call that function from your C sharp code. So this is like uh, jumping over water jumping over the creek to get water, as you say in Sweden. Um, uh, and also a thing about Blazor components is that you think you're working with HTTP, but they do not have an HTTP context um, because some things are executed on the, on the client and some on the server. So they don't have access to HTTP context, which means that you cannot set like headers, you can't set cookies, anything like that in, in your component. And that forces you to take some um, strange paths sometimes. If you need something specifically set on the server side in the HTTP context, you will have to set up a REST controller, an API controller, and you will have to call that from your Blazor code uh, in order to get a HTTP context. And uh, the same if you want to do client side browser specific stuff, you have to do that with JS interrupts. Okay. Um, some words about maturity level here. Um, Vue has been around since 2014. That was one of the main reasons for me to, to recommend this to, to the customer um, in this case. I think it's stable and, and it's battle hardened. Uh, Vue 3 is released um, and they're doing a great job. It has a, a, a thriving community and uh, uh, there's a lot of packages to, to go with Vue if you want to. Uh, with Blazor, it's kind of the opposite. This is uh, this is smoking hot. This is new. Uh, it's been around since 2018, so that's two years, but two years of de development. Uh, and right now, it's under heavy development. And as I said, they had to remove stuff from .NET 5, uh, which will be postponed to .NET 6. Um, so things things is happening here. Um, and who knows what will happen in a year. Uh, Blazor might be uh, old within a year. I, I have no idea. So that's just some words about the maturity level. Uh, okay, my conclusions then, my recommendations before jumping into crowning the winner. Uh, so if you ask me when to use Vue and when to use Blazor, uh, I would say that you should probably pick Vue if you're more familiar with client-side development, if you're more familiar with JavaScript, uh, if you're more familiar with backend development, uh, C Sharp, uh, Visual Basic, uh, ASP.NET, then you should probably go with Blazor. Um, and I should, I would probably go with Vue if I want to build something really, really big, a lot of uh, flows, a lot of use cases implemented. Um, mostly because of the, the separation, the, the forced separation between presentation and, and the infrastructure, um, and, and that I can have teams working on the front end side of the application and teams working on the back end side of the, the application. Um, I would also use Vue if I needed multiple client apps. With that, I mean like if I need both a web app and I need an Android app and an iPhone app, uh, iOS app, um, because in the view case, you will have to write some kind of API, some kind of backend and, and expose an API. Uh, and then you can use that API for, for both your clients. When writing Blazor components, you don't have the need to write an API for everything. And if you were, if you have to write an API and use that from Blazor, you should probably go with Blazor WebAssembly. Um, but I will go with, with Vue if I have that requirement. Uh, and also, if I wanted to build something really, really small, um, I, I would use Vue as well, like just one page. I want to have uh, show and hide functionality in one page on a static website. I, I would just drop in Vue there and I would do it with Vue. I wouldn't actually import the entire .NET 
runtime and, and write that in Blazor. Uh, and of course, uh, Vue has uh, long time support. Blazor does not yet. It will get long time support in .NET 6 in a year. Uh, so if you want long time support, you have to wait. Uh, so when to use Blazor then? Uh, well, if you don't need long time support yet, or if you can wait a year for it, uh, you could use Blazor. Um, uh, and perhaps if you want to build something large, not huge, but large, uh, and it's not super small either. If it's somewhere in between there, then Blazor is probably a good fit and, and uh, you don't like to write front end applications. Uh, and also if you don't need full browser integration, if you don't need to, to communicate with browser APIs, then you could also go with Blazor because you don't have to. So it's not going to be in the way of you. You don't have to write JavaScript interrupts for any, for the stuff that you can't do in Blazor. OK, which one is the best then? I don't know. As I said, in the conclusion, it depends. Uh, I'm sorry, I will not give you a, a winner here. Uh, I, I just won't. Um, look at what you're going to build. Uh, take a look at that and decide from that. Um, I, I would like to to tell you a story about the migration, though. Um, the thing with the migration at the customer, which I talk, talked about earlier, when we first built the view application, we test drove that from an end-to-end -end perspective. And then after a couple of weeks development, we said, OK, we should port this to Blazor, and all the end-to-end -end tests should be green. We did that in, in under two weeks, and, which was fast for that application. Um, it was not due to, to Blazor being so user-friendly or, or Vue being so easy to port to Blazor. It was because we had the right separation of uh, presentation and, and domain logic and infrastructure. Uh, it was because we had test-driven our code both from, from the outside with the end-to-end -end test and, it, and even the inside components with, with unit tests. Uh, so, so that's what, what made the transition easy. It was not due to the frameworks. It was due to the architecture. Uh, and uh, I would like to leave you with one thought uh, uh, that everything changes all the time. Uh, new frameworks, they come and old, they go. Uh, not many years ago, everybody wrote jQuery. Uh, everybody wrote uh, Flash, Silverlight. I can go on forever. And there will be a day where some when somebody says that, oh, Vue, that's that's old. Old guys use Vue, and, and Blazor is uh, is also dusty and old. Uh, the new stuff here uh, will solve all your problems, but it's not the f it's not the frameworks that will solve your problems. It's your architecture and design and how you, you choose to use these frameworks and how you choose to isolate them in order to to replace them when new one comes. That's what will save the day. Okay, so uh, last slide is in Swedish, Tack, as we say. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, just uh, fire away in the chat and I will answer them as, as good as I can. Thank you, Andrea. Jimmy, you... Loads oh. of questions here. Do you want them, uh, Asa? Yeah, shoot. First question is, can Blazor only be run on uh, internet information server or is Apache possible? Um, no, uh, sorry, I'm just um, thinking. You can run your base applications in um, IIS, but uh, now it's Kestrel, which is the new cool um, application server to use. Uh, if you want to serve static stuff, uh, sure, use Apache or uh, Nginx or whatever. Uh, but you can just use Kestrel if you want to. So look into Kestrel, which is the application server shipped with .NET. Blazor server via Blazor WebAssembly. What should I select? Ooh, I think the WebAssembly uh, are uh, it's mature enough. They have browser support. You you. Pick which one you want to. I like Blazor Server. Oh, I said it out loud. I like Blazor Server since I don't have to write the HTTP layer, or sorry, the HTTP communication myself. I don't have to explicitly write communication between client and server myself. That'll be taken care of for, for me with Blazor Server. So if I'm not into all that, if I don't need offline support in my uh, in my application. 
I will go to Blazor server. Uh, this does put a lot of, it, it put more requirements on the server uh, than uh, Blazor WebAssembly, uh, but it'll be, a, uh, it'll be a nice user experience. Uh, in this case, this particular application which we are building, we will probably have users logging in, quickly doing what they are supposed to do, and then exiting. So they will be there for a minute or two, then exit. I think there will not be large uh, forms to fill in. Actually, no input at all. It's just read and sign and leave. Um, so I think that server is a, a good fit for that. Um, you have also, if you choose uh, Blazor WebAssembly, you will face the penalty of shipping .NET to the browser as well. Uh, of course, that can be uh, solved with CDNs and, and stuff like that. But if if it's the first time that your user going to download .NET to the browser in order to run that in WebAssembly, I think it's like two or three megabytes going to be downloaded, which is a lot. So if your uh, users are going to sit on the bus or uh, the train accessing your application, I should probably not go with uh, uh, WebAssembly. Yeah. But isn't it the risk that the server uh... Uh, variant will be too shifty, too much Absolutely. computation all the time? Could be, but they're fairly smart with this. Uh, so you can have like a, a bouncing rule saying how often to, to pass information to the server. Uh, and as I briefly mentioned, uh, the state transmitted back from the server to the client will be just a subset of the state. It will be stuff that that has changed. So if you have a, a large state in your component, say a list of thousands of documents or anything, uh, only the ones affected by the, the state update will be returned back. So they try to keep the chattiness to, to a minimum or at least the, the payload for the chats to a minimum. Um, but of course, all of this happens under the cover you're not in control of it. So yeah, it could be. Uh, and I'm sure you can make developer mistakes which will force uh, Blazor to ship a lot more data back and forth than, than it has to. I, I guess if you write really big components, that could be a, an issue instead of separating your components into smaller ones. Guess so. If one already uses uh, Vue, React, or Angular, are there any reason to change Blazor if the opportunity occurs? Yeah, I would say that if you, if you have an application like this, you have written a client-side application, which is tightly coupled to your, to your backend and you have written a backend yourself um, and you're fed up with having to write validation for like format validation on both client side and server side and you're fed up with writing a transaction objects in order to just communicate from client to server. Uh, then yeah, you could save a lot of rows of code by, by changing, um, of course, but just to rewrite and that will magically solve some business problems. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. But this, uh, yeah, sure. If this hinders you to be fast in development and have a short time to market, maybe. Uh, was there any notable performance differences between the view and Blazor version of the site? Oh, noticeable is a nice word. Thanks. Um, I couldn't notice. I haven't done hardcore performance testing on this. I haven't. And we haven't done any load testing on, on it either. So um, I'm sorry, I can't give a, a, a qualified answer to that question. Sorry. Uh, but from my experience, when just uh, using the UI, uh, I, I can't feel that one of them is slower than the other or, or less responsive. Uh, they actually feel very fast and rapid, both of them. Without uh, ser server pre-rendering, was TDD similar between the view and Blazor application, both in writing the tests and execution time, including yeah. the test? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, yeah, it, it's a bit harder. When you write the end-to-end -end test, you could start with uh, if you start from the outside, write your end-to-end -end test, you could, in the case of uh, view, you can mock out the, uh, the network layer and just say that um, for my first iteration of these tests, I, I will stub the network. I will, uh, I will fake the server responses and I can just test the client side part of the application. 
and that forces me to go from red to green faster in that case. Uh, that's not as easy, but almost as easy in the in the blazer um, the blazer variant. However, with blazer, um, it is harder from a Cypress point of view or from any testing framework point of view to, to tell the server to respond in a, in a specific way. Um, that is very hard. Uh, and it, it, since you use single R, it's even harder to, to mock the network layer. Um, but if you don't care about stubbing or mocking the network layer, I would say it's uh, fairly easy. In some way, you will have to find a way to manipulate the backend to say what you want it to say in order to test your application functionality. Uh, and that's pretty much the same in both cases. Uh, and the final question, which of the two frameworks did you feel had the best developer ergonomics overall? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, for this specific case, um, with such a small client side application, not a lot of uh, logic there. I, I do think that Blazor is, is a better developer experience. Uh, I do. But at the same time, I don't trust Microsoft to, to keep up the good Blazor work uh, for as long as Vue will be around. Uh, so that's always a little devil on my shoulder saying that maybe they will abandon this the very next year or, or something. Uh, but from, from this application point of view, I, I thought I think that Blazor was, uh, was nice to work with. Uh, it's easy to test. It is easy to, to follow uh, uh, design principles, which uh, kind of like dependency injection and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and that the routing is uh, decentralized. I like that as well. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, hope, hope that answers the question. Final question from me then. I promised to book to the best question. Which question was the best? The one about which my favorite Swedish snack is. No, oh, I, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> um, there was a question about, uh, what was that? Can't remember now. This is one of the uh, questions you just uh, asked me after the presentation ended. It was something about uh, I can't remember, Yumi. You can you can pick the one. Can I can I read the chat log as well? Yes, I can. Should probably go through that and. Uh... Well, maybe the, the Swedish snack question was. Quite... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Stay, well, um... <laughs> Yeah, I think the question, oh no, that's Benny's question. If uh, one already uses Vue, React, or Angular, are there any reason to change to Blazor if the opportunity occurs? I think that's a reasonable question. That's, that's the kind of thing developers do all the time, right? So they see a new shiny thing, a new shiny framework, and they say, we have to, we have to change to it. Uh, it'll be awesome. It'll solve all our problems. And it's, it's just a new shiny thing for them. Uh, I don't think that if, if this will actually benefit your business, then you shouldn't do it. Of course, you, you shouldn't. There's no reason to do it if you can't have any uh, positive kickbacks from it. Uh, it will just be another rewrite because, because rewrites. That's a great question, but I don't want to give the book to Benny because uh, he will get another book. Um, um, let's see. You uh, you realize you said, oh, no, it's Benny's question, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, I did. It is Benny's question, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm reading the chat now. Um, uh, we had a question about the life cycle of uh, life cycle methods, that methods. That's a great question. That should be awarded a book, I think. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Okay, any other no new questions since I started rambling about uh, um, all the questions? No? Cool. I don't have anything else to, uh, to add. Uh, do you, Jimmy, do you have any final words to say? No, I don't. No. Great uh, getting some uh, questions, thanks. Thanks to everybody who joined. And thanks to Michael and the crew for arranging this. And thanks to you, Andreas. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So hopefully next time we'll see each other, it'll be in real life in Malmö, on Fou Cafe. 
I hope so. We will share a beer or a bear, something like that. A bear? <laughs> Sounds Russian. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Uh, I guess that Mickey will close the uh, presentation. I will stop presenting uh, to start with. Um, I'm not sure if uh, anybody else is listening still, but uh, if you are, then if you are more interested in this, you could of course contact me or Jimmy or, or Mickey and they will put you in contact with us and I will answer any questions you guys have. Uh, so if you come up with a question tonight or tomorrow, just uh, throw them away and I will answer as good as I can. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Benny wants a book or somebody else, by the way. So. Okay, we'll have to send a book to Benny as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.